Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, intuitive counselor, and above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on the quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Many of you might be surprised by the title of today's episode. After all, over the past six years of my podcast, I have never had a UFO topic. And there is a reason for that. You see, while I'm very interested in the subject of UFOs and ETs, I didn't want to engage in a believe it or not type of conversation, as this is not the angle of my podcast. And so I've been waiting for the right guest, an expert in this field, with whom I could have this conversation at a higher and more meaningful level. While I do critically explore uncommon and even controversial topics in my interviews and ask probing questions, I always do that with a completely open mind. My intuition and insight and my philosophical position that everything is possible under the sun unless proven to the contrary. So if, for example, someone says that there is no such thing as ghost, or the afterlife, or reincarnation, or angels or God, I say, prove it. (laughs) When someone says there is no such thing as UFOs or ETs, again I'll say, prove it. And in the meantime, I happily explore the evidence confirming their existence. I have been drawn to the subject of UFOs and anything mysterious and mystical since my early childhood. When I was about 10 years old, I read Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken, which has validated for me what I always sensed and knew, that we are not alone in this universe. I have had a few personal encounters with ETs and UFOs, including of the fourth and the fifth kind, which were confirmed under hypnosis, but I don't talk about them, other than to say that their final message was, we'll meet again. But I would like to tell you, as a preamble to this interview, if you like, about my encounter of the first kind. One night in December 1996, I lived in Perth, Western Australia at the time, so that was in summer. I was on my veranda, looking up into the sky as I often do, wondering about all other civilizations out there, when I saw a bright light at a distance, high up on the dark sky, which was slightly brighter than Venus or any other planet you can see with the naked eye. It was stationary, but strangely pulsating on the edges, and so I just kept staring at it. This wasn't a plane or a helicopter. There was no sound. Total silence. After a few minutes, that light has spawned two similar lights moving slowly downwards and outwards until they created a perfect triangle. And then they stopped. It looked, in fact, exactly like the triangle in the footage in one of Dr. Stephen Greer's films I have recently seen. But instead of those two lights merging back with the main one, Like on the footage, after a couple of minutes, they started moving away from the mothership very slowly until they were gone. 
Then the mothership started moving upwards and away, again very slowly, as if, and hopefully, <laughs> they wanted me to see this and understand what I was looking at. I was mesmerized, and after a few milliseconds of my logical mind searching for any plausible explanation of what I was seeing in vain, I knew that I was looking at a UFO. In my mind, I kept saying, please come closer, please come back, <laughs> I want to talk to you, I want to meet you. <laughs> However, meeting with me was not on their agenda at that time. While I'm not actively involved in the UFO ETS conversation, I keep my eyes and ears open and can't wait for the full disclosure, the day we will officially meet and greet our cosmic neighbors. And I would love to talk to any ET living here, maybe even interview them on my podcast. <laughs> in the meantime, I felt it is time to have a serious conversation with an expert in this field and in search for one, I went straight to the top. My special guest today is Paula Harris. Paula is an Italo-American photojournalist and a well-known in the UFO circles investigative reporter in the field of extraterrestrial phenomena-related research. She has a master's degree in education and is a widely published freelance writer who has studied ET-related phenomena since 1979, has interviewed many high-ranking military personnel and astronauts and worked closely with many leading researchers in this field. Paula has lectured throughout Europe about the importance of making ufology a serious scientific study. Her non-profit association, Starworks USA, brings American speakers to Italy and promotes disclosure and international dialogue on this topic. Paula has written seven books, including the recently published Trinity, The Best Kept Secret, co-authored with Jacques Vallée, which we will talk about in this conversation. And now she joins me from Longmont, Colorado. Hello, Paula. Welcome to Quantum Living. Oh, my goodness. I'm thrilled to have you on my show. And thank you so much for making yourself available for this interview during such a hectic schedule you have. Thank you, Anna. It's, it's really a pleasure. I mean, this is my favorite topic. And I get to speak with someone of your background. And I think that uh, just hearing you express yourself with your honesty, and uh, I think this is it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation. Now, let me begin by saying I know personally Eric Von Dunnigan. I've done uh, conferences with him, and, wow. uh, and I know personally it's Dr. Stephen Greer. I have been on, mm. I don't know, about five CE5s with him, which are week-long retreats, and I was in two of his films, the first one being a film called Serious, Serious like the uh, the uh, star, the mm -hmm. constellation Sirius. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you're talking about these people, they're, they're people that have done a great deal to further the intellectual thinking on this field. Because my approach, and you're going to hear it, is an academic more than scientific, because I don't know what science can explain this. So it's more of an academic approach because I have a master's in education, have taught high school English and in ancient history for 40 years. So when I'm talking about this, I, I would like people to like go to a university and study about this. I'd mm -hmm. like people to look at it as let me uh, get all the books from the sources and put them in my library. I'd like people to speak intelligently about this so that we can exchange ideas. Absolutely. The main challenge I have with this interview is to capture the key, most important information and insight from the huge body of knowledge and expertise that you have on this subject, which is important, if not critical for us to know. And of course, we will only scratch the surface, but I'm happy to, to keep talking for as long as you wish. To begin with, could you please tell us how you became involved in the subject of unidentified aerial phenomena and extraterrestrial intelligence? Please tell us your story. 
Well, first of all, it is a UFO. So the fact that the government calls it, uh, uh, you know, a UAP does not change mm-hmm. <laughs> anything. It makes it, it supposedly makes it more, um, you know, more scientific, but it is unidentified flying object or flying phenomena. Yeah. And, you know, I can answer your question very easily because the, um, the early years, 1980, when I saw the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and I was given the class to teach science fiction here in Colorado. I was not interested in anything. I didn't know anything. And I was in my 30s. And what had happened is that um, I went to see this film. At the very end, there was an emotional reaction to that scene where Colomb, who is the French uh, you know, astronomer scientist that is doing the research, and little did I know I'd ever meet Jacques Vallée, um, has that interchange with the being. And I was listening to what you were saying about interviewing and actually talking with the being and having contact with the being. And that that part in the movie made me cry. So, and I, and I was surprised. I said, why am I so emotional? But just because he's, you know, uh, the Francois Truffaut was the actor that did that. Uh, just because he smiles and he, and he has had these hand gestures and the being, you know, does the same thing. The, the, being, the being communicates. So that led to a search to see if this material was real. And by coincidence or accident, and we can talk about this in your podcast, because mm-hmm. my life is a series of coincidences. And coincidences are the way that extraterrestrials talk. Synchronicities mm-hmm. and coincidences. They don't... Yeah. At the fact that your life, you may be thinking about something and then the next minute you're involved. Well, I, I thought to myself, I need to go to talk to Dr. Heineck, who is the consultant. And so there was a wedding in Evanston, Illinois, and that's where the Center for UFO Studies was. And I pulled away from the family and I went to that center, which was regular office and never expected to see Dr. Heineck. But when I walked in, I told the secretary I spoke Italian, I was Italian, and was this real? Did they have files? And she said, yes, here they all are. And from around the corner came this very distinguished man with a pipe, and it was Dr. Heineck. And he said to me, I heard that you speak Italian. Would you be willing to work with me? And my God, I mean, (laughs) you know, I couldn't believe he didn't even know me. But it was part of the, I think, predestined schooling that I needed to have. So what happened was I said, yes. And I knew right away in the six years that I worked with him until he died, that this was real. He was an astronomer. He was, this was not a joke. It was, he, he had been part of project blue book, you know, the air force study. Um, And I traveled with him and I met his family. I'm very close to his, I was very close to his wife and children And, you know, the thing that I will tell you, because this is a personal interview, is I was fine with this as long as all I had to do was translate and put pins in a map for sightings. I didn't want to and didn't understand what was inside the craft and didn't even want to go there. That was very difficult for me to digest, because as long as you have me doing something as as uh, nuts and bolts, as cut and dry, as putting pins and maps and doing something like that, then I don't have to answer the greater questions that your show goes into. Mm-hmm. You know, the greater quantum paranormal questions of reality. I didn't, I don't want to go there. I, I didn't, in the beginning, I, I couldn't go there. I, I couldn't do that. I just did the nuts and bolts. Mm, beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And by the way, we will talk more about the movies and the agenda and messages there. But you are very passionate about your, your work, clearly. What is your mission? What drives you? 
Well, you know, when I speak to people, because it's not normal, and I, I, I'll be honest with you, my children won't talk about this. They've never read my books. They've never seen <laughs> me my videos. And, and what they say is, Mom, that's your thing. You know, what does it have to do with our lives? Which I think, you know, probably 50% of the planet says. It's like an assignment. Uh, it, I don't like the word mission. It has religious connotations, and this isn't. And there's no part of ufology that's religious. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is more like an assignment that that I was given. Um, I was given the assignment, and then consequently, whoever is guiding this put me in the right place at the right time to do the assignment because none none of it came from me. I didn't you know, go looking for Colonel Philip Corso. 1997 in Roswell, the whole world came together, all the big names uh, mm -hmm. for the 50th anniversary. And I was in Italy uh, suffering from a failed relationship and I didn't want to cover the story. Mm -hmm. And I said to my boss, I never read the book. I don't know what this man looks like. I don't want to go to Roswell. And he said, you must do this. He said, because this book talks about back engineering. In other words, artifacts from crashes that the government has taken and use the technology. And Paula, you've got to go. And so when I did go to Roswell, I didn't have a place to sleep or I didn't, I wasn't prepared. So when I got to the media place, they said to me, we know you're, you know, from out of town and this place has been booked because for it's the 50th anniversary, just go to the phone book and try to get a place to stay. And I opened the phone book in the first uh, hotel was a Sally Port Inn, and I called them, and I and they said yes, we have a room for three nights, and it happened to be the room right next to Colonel Philip Corso. <laughs> so I I didn't do that. This is what I mean by coincidences. Wow. And when I went to do the story, and he was doing the press conference, uh, his son uh, and I didn't know it was son saw my badge, Italy. And he said, ask my father up there a question in Italian. So I, I said, I can't. And his son pushed me into the crowd because uh, there was cameras in every, every, everywhere and I didn't want to be public. But I asked him in Italian about the Santilli footage. I don't know if you've ever, ever seen the famous alien autopsy footage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he answered me in Italian and he said, you know, he said, I had, as part of the artifacts, this huge lens that covered the eye of the being, which Colonel Corso always thought was a clone or, or an extraterrestrial biological entity or artificial intelligence. He didn't think it had its own autonomy. He said, I had that. We peeled it off, he said, and we used to walk up and down the halls of the Pentagon and could see the furniture at night. So he answered that question very well. And then he looked at me and he said, I need to speak to you. And I really didn't know I had the room next to him. So I was in shock, you know, that I was able to get an extraordinary interview from Colonel Corso mm -hmm. because I saw him coming out of the room next to me. And, and I know that the rest of my life with all the encounters, including Jacques Vallée here at the end, have all been kind of pre-programmed. Okay. So if you don't like the word mission, what is the objective of your task? I think probably data collecting. You know, okay. I, I have collected, you You mentioned my books, you know, they are only interviews. There's no part of my opinion in anything. How can you have an opinion? You know, it's so unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, I have interviewed um, Uri Geller was a good friend of mine. Uh, jo Dr. John Mack came to my apartment in Rome. He was a Harvard University professor. Uh, Jesse Marcel Jr., who touched the artifacts of Roswell at nine years old. Dr. Edgar Mitchell, uh, Apollo 14 astronaut, very close friend of mine. But I want to talk about him later on because mm -hmm. he told me that he did experiments from the moon. I think that'll help with the subject matter that's on wow. your podcast. And um, of course, the former defense minister of Canada, Paul Hallier, and Clifford Stone, who did 12 crash retrievals with live and dead aliens. Now, the book is collecting data from the sources, from the people who actually did that. 
And, and my big, uh, uh, you know, complaint in, in mm-hmm. 2020, 22 here is that everybody gets their stuff secondhand off in internet. And nobody reads the original work of the sources. If you're going to do a paper on Einstein, you don't do go and talk to all the people that knew Einstein. You read Einstein's life and his work. And, and uh, we don't do that. We don't go to the original sources to see to put together the pieces of the puzzle because people don't like to read anymore. So they go on internet, they go on YouTube, and they get all this misinformation and what I call mythology. And so the whole UFO field is filled with mythology. And for some reason, you asked about my assignment, I went and got the exact testimonies from the exact people. And that's what the assignment was. Now, in the end, I mean, you and I, if we, if anybody that does this is going to affect their thinking. So in the end, uh, I'm going to tell you this right now. Uh, I, I have uh, donated all my materials to Rice University in Houston, Texas. All of it goes there, all the audio, everything. But in the end, the graduate school of this study, and it is a study, is consciousness. So the graduates, so that I I don't want to go backwards. Uh, if we're going to go to consciousness, let's go to consciousness. It's the grad school. Anybody that does anything on consciousness is already way up there in graduate school. Yes, mythology, disinformation, misinformation, which is a probably a separate or although related topic, and it is important to keep it in mind. But let's now talk about your books. You are a very prolific writer. You have written seven books, as I understand, on the subject since 2008, including the most recent one, Trinity, The Best Kept Secret, co-authored with Jacques Vallée which is an investigative report on the New Mexico UFO crash in 1945, two years before the well-known incident at Roswell and the famous UFO sighting by pilot Kenneth Arnold in 1947. I would like to quote from the book's description on Amazon. The Honorable Paul Haler, former Minister of National Defense of Canada, has stated, Paula Harris and Jacques Vallée have spent much effort doing field research on location. It is now time that their discovery be revealed to the world. Christopher Mellon, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, called the data fresh reason to believe that our government is concealing physical proof of alien technology. And Professor Paul Hynek added that the research reveals a new UFO history. Could you please tell us about this book and its importance to the UFO narrative? Well, it's a, it's another one of those stories. I was in Italy and I had read about these two little boys who had seen a UFO crash near Socorro one month after the atomic bomb explosion. And my first thinking was, I'm in Italy, I can't do anything. Why aren't my colleagues out there doing this? Why aren't they questioning these, these boys and so forth? Because... In 1945, Remy Baca was seven and Jose Padilla was nine. And they were the two little boys that actually witnessed this. Uh, And what had happened was I came to the United States in 2007. I came back because I have two grown children here in Colorado. By accident or design, here we go again with the coincidences, the son of the pilot that did the overflight of that crash called me on the phone. And and he was talking to me about his father, who had worked in the Army Air Force. It was really Army at that time. They had broken off in 1948. And, and I said, I, I think I know that case. And he, he goes, do you want the telephone numbers of the two little boys? And I thought, whoa, I, it isn't that my colleagues didn't do it. It's that I'm supposed to do it. Mm. And, and, and it comes to me that the material comes to me. So I spent a lot of time interviewing Remy Baca, who lived in Washington State, and Jose Padilla, 
who who at that time lived in California. He now lives in New Mexico near the crash site. And for five years, I kept going down to New Mexico because those two little boys know exactly where. There's a mark of where the crash is. They they know exactly where it is. They have the exact same story, having lived apart for 50 years. They were in two different states, and the only way they got together was through a genealogy search of one of the sons. So here's these two boys who, after 60 years, are telling their story, the exact story. And I realized then that the story was more important than any story in ufology because it was a statement against our um, our testing. And it was not a test. Jacques, this book will, uh, will tell you that the atomic bomb um, explosion at Trinity was not a test. There's no such thing as a test. It, it actually caused damage of 150 mile radius where everybody suffered in the in the in the terms of Jose's family. His mother opens the door at 430 in the morning and sees the light of a thousand suns and it's blinded in one eye. And Jose himself loses his eardrum uh, to the sound. And so those people were not told that the Manhattan Project was happening. So, but it was the Manhattan Project called an alarm, an SOS to other worlds, because it started the nuclear age. Mm -hmm. And and we can't put the genie back in the bottle. There's no way of uninventing nuclear. So now we're playing an infinite chess game where the only way to win is to checkmate. You know, China has to have it. uh, Russia has to have it. India has to have it. Everybody has to have a bomb you know, or, or, or we were in danger. And so you might be interested in knowing I've been to the Trinity site where the bomb was actually exploded, the actual place, because all the sand has turned to glass. Uh, I've been there twice. Um, There is a plaque from Oppenheimer, who was the scientist who was the chief scientist for the Manhattan Project, and there is a quote. It said, uh, "Robert Oppenheimer, this is the the uh, the beginning of the nuclear era." And and the quote from the Bhagavad Gita, "I am death, the the destroyer of worlds, plural, not world worlds, plural." And uh, and why would Oppenheimer put that plaque right there with the um, connotation that this there's not just one world we're affecting. There's mm-hmm. dimensions which are many worlds, and I am death, which means that that for us this book, which is an amazing book, Jacques is an amazing writer. He writes it like a novel. It's a history book more than a UFO book. This book says, in a way, this is a mess that was a message to mankind way before Roswell, way before anybody knew what UFOs were. Mm. So what actually happened? In New Mexico in 1945. Okay, well, what happened was that Remy Bach and Jose Padilla, Jose was nine, Remy was seven, they were they were mending fences. There was a big thunderstorm because if you know Roswell too, the, there was a huge thunderstorm. Uh, and the it, thunder and lightning is horrible in New Mexico. Uh, and it could have interfered with this avocado-shaped craft that actually took out a piece of what they call an Italian tower, which is a Marconi tower, radio Mm -hmm. tower, a piece of it, hit it, and then landed on the property of Jose Padilla's dad. And so the boys watched it all. They actually saw it come in in, from the area of Trinity. This is a month after the atomic bomb uh, went off, and they saw it land. So the two little boys being mischievous, and they didn't know what, nobody knew what any any UFO was then. Mm -hmm. They thought it was a plane that crashed. They walk up to it, not quite all the way because there's fire and smoke and on the, on the bushes, but they have a um, binoculars and they, and they see a panel has been blown out. 
So they see three little beings that were sliding back and forth. They called it sashaying back and forth. And Jose hears loud crying like a baby crying, or like he's so he's so precise, or like he said, when you kill a rabbit, that la that screeching sound. And he I thought they were yeah. hurt. And he wanted to go in and help them. He, he he said, Paula, he said, if I had gone in, I wouldn't be here today. He said, but I wanted to help them. They look like children to me because they were the same size we were. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, uh, but he said, because Remy started to cry, Remy was seven. He said, we didn't do that. However, some interesting things around that crash, the boys were there for a half an hour. And uh, Remy, uh, who is living in a completely different state from Jose for 50 years, is telling me the same exact story. But he said that when he looked at the beings, they gave him a vision of people falling out of skyscrapers. Now, Remy at, at seven had never seen a skyscraper in his life. And people falling out of skyscrapers to me sounds a lot like September 11th. Yeah. And to a poor little seven year old. Um, and then what was interesting was when we did the story and I had gone down there three times a year for five years before Jack came on it, on the story. And then Jack was with me for four years after that. The boys start telling me details. They said that when the UFO hit the tower, it spewed out uh, angel hair, what they call angel hair. And so they picked it up put it in a big bag because all lit up in purple and white and pink. And they had no electricity then. So they took it home and they trimmed the Christmas tree with it. <laughs> and they trimmed the windows with it. And they gave it to the neighbors and because they didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say fiber optics. I don't want to, I don't, because we don't know, but it came from the crash. So the innocence of these kids having these artifacts and explaining them, then later on in the book, I found the seven-year-old girl who lived there and saw the Christmas tree all decorated with this stuff. And she describes holding it and how they decorated it. And then she also describes that that Jose's father, and Jose didn't know this, uh, had gone back and gotten a long piece of aluminum foil that would, when you would crunch it up, it would go back to its regular form. So this story is extraordinary because, number one, of the geopolitical implications, it was 1945 before Roswell. Number two, we have the exact location. We have now four witnesses. And uh, in, in if, if we hadn't covered it, this would have gone, it wouldn't have had any effect at all because those beings on some metaphysical level knew Jacques and I were going to write a book 60 years later. Or why bother crashing? Yeah. You know, if it had gone uh, hide, hidden in history, it wouldn't have been important. That there would be no statement about uh, about the, the nuclear situation. And of course, this is just one example. One example of so many. I interviewed Robert Salas, uh, who in 1969 was uh, in charge of the missiles at um, in South Dakota. Uh, and the Maelstrom Air Force Base missile shutdown of 10 missiles, one right after the other, was also a statement. They didn't destroy them. The, 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 you, and this is data. This isn't like we're not talking mythology. It's in yeah. the Blue Book files. And they had two incidents in, in South Dakota of that. And then the Russians had a problem with the codes activating on their own. And it was the Cold War. So that's why I say, well, you look at the the uh, the implications looking at the dates of these things that happen. In other words, the geopolitical implications. So we have missiles pointing at each other and something up there is going, we're not going to let you do this because you already are in trouble that you you've uh, um, you've invented this this destructive force that could destroy your whole entire planet. Uh, Colonel Corso, who I was very close to, I've written a book called Conversations with Colonel Corso. And I had a tape recorder on me all the time. And since he was not allowed to speak in the United States because it was a court case against the book, I had him in Italy twice. And he told me that Project Horizon was a project to explode an atomic bomb on the moon. Do you know the insanity of that? Wow. 
Because if there's somebody on the moon yeah. or something on the moon, the humans are coming with the atomic bomb to test it on the moon. Yeah. I mean, I wonder why we weren't invited back. Yes. More questions than answers. Now, coming back for a moment to that New Mexico crash, has any of that sparkling material been preserved? What happened with it? Well, there was a fire on the on the property, so the uh, the angel hair material disappeared. And, surprise, and, surprise. But <laughs> the whole story is, uh, yeah, in the fire, uh, the whole entire uh, ranch house burned down. Mm -hmm. But that isn't the end of it because the boys watched the army clean it up for seven days. The same boys that cleaned up the um, the uh, the crash. I mean, the army came and asked Mr. Padilla to cut the fence. And I saw where the fence was cut because they were taking out a weather balloon 30 mm -hmm. feet long, right? 30 feet long weather balloon on a flatbed truck. So <laughs> the boys watched the the uh, the craft being put on the flatbed truck. And they knew the Owl Barn Cafe. The Owl Barn Cafe is right there in, in San Antonio. And that is where um, that is where uh, Oppenheimer and a lot of the Manhattan scientists had their cabins. In fact, I've talked to the people at the cafe and they said, we thought they were traveling salesmen because they had these leather cases. We didn't know they mm. were planning this. And so the boys had seen some of the young guys uh, cleaning up the uh, the you know the uh, crash site. They knew them because they were in the Al Barn Cafe. I mean, how Jose bought hamburger for the Al Barn Cafe. They knew that, and so they waited till they went back to the Al Barn Cafe on the last day. And Jose, being what he is, went and jumped on the flatbed truck. Went inside the craft. There was a big plate there uh, with a, two circles. One was copper. And one was silver. And in the middle was a bracket that spun, that spun around. So he took the crowbar and pulled out the bracket. Uh, it, it, it looks, it's quite big. It's it's almost two feet long. Mm -hmm. And they went and hid it because they wanted a souvenir or a tesoro in Spanish. So the whole story of where they hid it, what happened when they hid it, what happened when the sheep herder found it, I mean, all of that is in the book Trinity, which is amazing. Mm. Now, because Jose, uh, you know, Remy died in 2013 of diabetes, because Jose was very grateful to me for doing this story after so many years, and because he was, he didn't want to talk about it because he had stolen something from the government, he gave me the bracket. So I had it in a bank vault for two years. And when Jacques came to me, he wanted the metal. He wanted the bracket. And that's how that started, the, the joining together of our efforts. So I gave uh, Jacques the bracket to take to Stanford University, to California, to the scientists to be examined. We don't have any results yet. The location, the witnesses, and a piece of the mm. UFO inside the UFO. And I don't no any case no planet that has that wow so it hasn't been confiscated by government no it, it's 60 years later if they confiscated it it would be a big story and they're not mm. gonna they're not gonna however i mean to be honest it isn't like i haven't had um in other words when i went to interview sabrina the seven-year-old who's now in her late uh, 60s I, I I went with Chris Mel and he, he, that you mentioned, you know, in the book, and I went with Jacques, and we questioned her in Los Angeles. And just before I got there, what happened was she got a phone call that said Paula Harris will not be coming. We will take care of this. So she was very upset, and she called me and she said, "You're not coming." I said, "Of course I'm coming," but somebody was trying to intimidate mm -hmm. her. So it isn't like. When we're doing this work, nobody's watching. I mean, yeah. I've, I'm not stupid. I've had all kinds of things happen to me in my career. I mean, the phone is 
is co uh, controlled. The, you know, as long as you don't do anything that's, you know, way out there, you're okay. But that mm -hmm. telephone call was not normal. You know, we will take care of this. I felt like saying, who are, who are you that's going to take care of this? And, and so the idea that, you know, it's out there. And, you know, the irony, Anna, is that yeah, all my colleagues haven't read it. You know, so, I mean, the people in the UFO community, everybody knows, they don't read each other's work. And it's so sad because if the Roswell people would have read it or somebody, we could sit down at an academic table and discuss what's happening and put together pieces of the puzzle. But our field isn't like that. Why? And, and it's frustrating. Oh, because I think it's a matter of money, book sales, and when you have something, it becomes your story. Well, mm -hmm. no, there's no such thing as your story. This is the story of planet Earth. Yeah. This, this is the story for, of the people. This belongs to the people of this planet. Trinity is a book, a, a history book for planet Earth. It is not our story, mm -hmm. you know, and neither does any other case belong to anybody. It's yeah. Yeah, if you're gathering. Uh, data, uh, you know, and, and I always say, I'm always kidding around and go, well, you know, I don't understand the ufology field. And if you're studying like cryptology or zoology and you're Diane Fossey and you're studying the gor gorillas how, how and you're studying all of that, what, you read your own book and that's how you find out? No, mm. if you're going to get a degree in that anthropology, you have to read about 10 books. Yeah. Not your own book. You have to read everybody's book. I mean, is that logical? Yes. I, I don't understand how you can say you're even in the field of ufology. You've never read. I've read every single one of my colleagues' books. So I have a library of over 300 books, but it helps me with my work. Yep, yes, absolutely. And perhaps even there is, there is a reason for that uh, UFR community split, if you like. In other words, it is possible that it is intentional beyond the you know the usual money, books, and profits, etc., uh, and ownership issues. And I also feel that uh, the fact that that farm uh, has burned out completely no, well, with no, all material happened? in no, it. He told us. He told it us wasn't accidental. No, they wanted uh, one of the cousins wanted insurance money, mm. and yeah. I know which cousin it was. He mm -hmm. he was angry. He wanted insurance money, and he burned. Yeah. I mean, people do that. It wasn't no. The government the government went back there. Actually, the army went back there in 1950 and prohibited the Padilla family from going back mm -hmm. because they wanted to make sure they got every single piece. Yeah, because those boys had never done anything like this. Can you imagine two boys? I mean, 20-year-old uh, kids that had been part of the, the atomic bomb project, they go up there, they see an avocado-shaped craft. They don't know if it's an airplane. They don't know UFO. There's no Kenneth Arnold. And they're they're going, this is a pain in the neck. Let's not pick up all the pieces. So they make a little hole in the ground and they throw them in there. Mm. <laughs> and so <laughs> they're going, you know, we, we just want and it. It took them a whole week to do it. A whole week because the boys yeah. were told not to go back there, but every day they went there and every day they're going, Oh my goodness, we're watching this. As soon mm -hmm. as everybody leaves, we're going to go get something. To listen to uh, them talk about it, it's so human. It's a human story. Yes. But I think it's important that people read it yeah. because when Jacques does anything, Jacques Vallée is a legend, he's fantastic. He studied the background of the Manhattan Project, and he found out, and that's the only time I've ever seen him get really emotional, that the emperor of Japan had already conceded before they threw the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. He had already conceded. So the excuse has always been it ended the war. No, they, uh, Japan already conceded. So... We Japan has just bought the rights to this book. I'm going, oh my goodness. Uh, wow. so the real truth is coming out here. We're playing with fire. We were playing with fire. Um, the nuclear situation is very, very volatile. Jacques read every book on the Japanese part of World War II. He read every book. And I had to read him too, because if he was reading 
you know, Children of Los Alamos, which I had to read the creation of the Los Alamos labs in New Mexico. If he was reading it, I had to read it. So mm. it's like I was, with the professor was telling me I'm reading this on page 36. And I thought, you know, that is how research should be. It should be academic. So I read the books. He read the books. And we put together a very factual with a geopolitical, uh, you know, phrase, uh, you know, a phase around it of what was going on at that time. And I keep thinking to myself, and I'm sharing this with you because of your show, that n- those beings knew we were going to do this. Otherwise, why, why, you know, they say, why, why all the crashes? Because yeah. in a funny kind of way, it's a gift to the planet. It's a yeah. physical manifestation. And people, it, it is, a, 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 we're coming off the top of our heads. There's physical data, there's physical stuff. And when I was talking to Remy first, I said, well, it's not in the blue book files where to go. And he goes, well, Paula, he said, I'm Hispanic and I helped get Dixie Lee uh, elected in Washington state. She was the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. And she was because everybody after this book came out, came and told me. And he goes to thank me for getting her elected. She went to the Atomic Energy Commission files and showed me our case. And the Atomic Energy Commission files are higher up and more classified than any files on the planet. The president can't even see them. Where is it going to go? There is no Air Force. There's no Blue Book. So it's there. And Remy said she let me see them. And she said he said she opened up the file and then she closed it. But she showed me that that it was there. So everybody says, where did the aliens go that were inside? Where did the craft go well obviously the flatbed truck that took it took it to los alamos i don't know where it went after that mm-hmm. and as far as the beings they're not going to hang out and be captured or anything they, they yeah. had their own agenda or whatever happened to them but the the important part is that the research done on this is so precise and over nine years it isn't like it happened in two years i was on it for five before Jacques came on the scene. Yes, and thank you for researching and writing this book and I I will obviously include the link to it in the show notes where people can purchase it and find out more about it because yes it is a very important if you like a piece of history and a piece into the current narrative that just like you have committed yourself to promoting and propagating the history and the origins and all those details that have been if you like suppressed for so many years it is now the time, the high time to bring it all to light. Now, do ETs in human form live amongst us visibly today? And if so, how many, what is their purpose and what do they do? I actually believe (laughs) that I have met such beings quite a few times. You can sense different energy. I guess this is the only way I can describe it when you meet someone and they are just so different, even though they may look normal, like a normal human being. And I am not talking about the ETs like in the Men in Black movie, (laughs) you know, little funny creatures, but those who either look very similar to us or are able to adopt a human form, even if they are non-physical by nature. So do ETs live amongst us? Well, I can't answer that question like that. I can only tell you what people have told me. Mm-hmm. I became very interested in, um, uh, because Colonel Corso had told me that the little gray beings were, were either clones or artificial intelligence. I began doing some research and found out that in Southern California in the 1950s and 60s, when the new age movement started to, you know, we had Yogananda, we had uh, Maharishi, there was contact of real space brothers with people in Southern California. The one that is most known is uh, George Van Tassel, who lived near Giant Rock, and with the help of Howard Hughes, built the Integratron. 
and he had met people, he said, from Venus. So we can only take his word from it. And Georgia Damsky, and I've been to where Georgia Damsky had the meeting with Orthon in Southern California at, uh, you know, near 29 Palms in, in Desert Center. I've been at that spot where Orthon not only spoke to Adamski, George Hunt Williamson, who was a famous researcher, took plaster casts of Orthon's shoes. So we have, if people go back in history, the real aliens or the real ETs, the real space visitors were human. It wasn't until 1961, there was no grays in the mythology. I mean, in 1961, with the abductions of Betty and Barney Hill, that it switched and it stayed there. I mean, every conference you go to, there's little gray statues you have to pose next to and all T-shirts and all this kind of stuff. So I began doing uh, research on Howard Menger, who had met people from Venus in Highbridge, New Jersey. I just went there in June to speak to this historical society. I just I began doing research on the island of of um, Sic uh, Sicily with Eugenio Sitakuzu. We met the same Venusians in the same blue space outfits with the same anti-nuclear message. So I began gathering the data of Menger or Feo Angelucci, uh, Adamski, and Howard Menger, and realized that what came to the United States in the 50s and 60s uh, were space brothers and, and, and with a definite message. And I think they did it because it was geopolitically, it was the jumpstart of the new age, what everybody calls the new age movement, you know, with the, with the dieting and the, you know, vegetarianism and all this. Mm -hmm. in, in that time, you know, of, of, of consciousness coming in, those same space brothers are now in, in, in uh, Latin America. That's why I've switched my focus. That's why I'm in Latin America in the Chilka Desert. These space people were coming off speaking to Sisto Poswells, his brother, Charlie, 10 other young people, Ricardo Gonzalez, and all those people that were there. They, they, and, and they're telling the truth. So whatever was there in Southern California decided it wasn't in their best interest to keep coming. I think one of the reasons is because the United States is ma mainly interested in the technology. And you asked me uh, if there were people living in Maga. So what I did is what you're doing. I talked to Timothy Good, who I think is one of the best researchers, if not the best on the planet. He had gone to Remy Baca before I did. It was in his book, 1945 case, before I even got there. And I said to Timothy, have you ever think you met um, a, uh, a person for not from here? And he said, yes. He said, I was in New York in a hotel, he said, and I saw a very well-dressed man with beautiful features. And mentally, he said, um, if you are not from here, take your index finger and put it on the left side of your nose. And he said, the man did just that. Wow. Picked up the newspaper. <laughs> walked out. I know. I know. Oh, I'm loving and, it. And, and, and I said, you did it telepathically. So then I started yeah. researching it. And may I recommend a book that everybody should read called They Are Here Visitors Without Passports. Mm -hmm. They Are Here Visitors with, by Michel Zurger. He's French. But he lives in Tokyo uh, because he married a Japanese woman. And so when I found out that he had done Adamski and George Hunt Williamson's re research, and his book was incredible because it talks about uh, human type aliens living in an apartment building in France and a lot of things like that. But he really went into the Adamski case, which is real, by the way. Uh, the, uh, he, um, I said to him, uh, you know, did anything ever happen to you? And he said, well, when I was working on the Adamski case, he said, in all the books that I did, he said, my wife and I went into a restaurant to eat in Tokyo. This is Tokyo. And he said, two men walked in, blonde, uh, short hair, not very long, like my length, which is shoulder length. He, and he said, um, he said, I thought they were very unusual. And they walked by my wife and me. They went in the corner. They had their meal. And mentally, he said, I wonder if they are extraterrestrials from somewhere else. And on the way out, after they finished their meal, they handed him a napkin. And in French, it said, nous sommes ici, we are here. 
How did they know he was French? And he, he, they handed mm. him a napkin. And I said, Michelle, they did that because they knew you were working on the Adamski work and they knew they were you were working on human type aliens and they knew wow. about your book. So I've come to the conclusion, if you're working in that area and they want to encourage you, they go to a restaurant. They <laughs> 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 have a meal and they come out. But what shocked me the most was it wasn't in English. It was in his language, French. Yeah. You saw me. We are here. Yeah, <laughs> go go to a restaurant and and look for men handing you napkins with some <laughs> writings on them. Well, I'm well, laughing, but it's telepathic. So yeah. then there's yeah. all other, uh, you yeah. know. And I told you that I wanted to talk about Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, and mm -hmm. the the common language of the universe. I mean, I don't think these ETs go to learn uh, French and uh, you know uh, Spanish and and uh, Czechos yeah. Czechoslovakian or Russian or anything. I think the common language of the universe is telepathy. Yeah. So then you have to go and study quantum physics. Then you have to go study entanglement. Then you have to go study direct thought transfer. Then you have to go study all that. See, when I say study, I mean an academic subject, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to go there and then you have to try to piece this together. So I was talking to Edgar Mitchell. I asked him if he, I, uh, he's, Apollo 14 astronaut who walked on the moon. Yeah. And he said, uh, I said, do you think that the world is ready for disclosure? And he said, no. He said, we're two separate. He said, we're, we're uh, a, a race that uh, is always hostile and we're separate. We can't come together as one species, one species human. And then he said, I said to him, well, what happened on the moon? And he said, well, Paula, he said, at that time I was an engineer, but I was interested in telepathy. So without NASA knowing, he said, I would do experiments from the moon. Down in Florida was my team. And at a certain hour, I would send them messages. And they, but they had in those days, I don't know, with t with uh, telepathy, they had the cards, the circle, the square, the, you know, you had to yeah. kind of guess and everything. They, mm -hmm. they had those cards. I don't know what they call them now, but he said he did those experiments and they were 90% effective from the moon. So mm -hmm. you're telling me that thoughts can come from the moon to the planet? Then we go, I said, well, Edgar, what does that mean? He's, he means the power of thought is the most important thing in the planet because yeah. thoughts can control reality, but thoughts can also change your reality. And and then and then you know he came back and instead of going into science he went into noetic sciences, which he he started uh, the noetic science the institute for at Petaluma California which, which dealt with examining Uri Geller and all the people that had these powers or these extra I think everybody has a sixth sense I think everybody has telepathy I think they don't use it because we're discouraged not to as children but. Obviously, that's going to be the common language for any communication with a, another kind of civilization, yeah. number one. And number two, I've learned from my studies, they play games. It's synchronicities. Mm -hmm. If they they want me to know that they know that I'm doing something, they set up a coincidence or I keep seeing 1111 or something uh, like I'm going to California now. My flight is 11:11. It's ridiculous. It's yeah. uh, you know things that I know. It's like we're talking to you, but we're talking to you in this symbolistic form, and you and you better get it. You better understand yeah. uh, because this is the way that we've chosen to communicate. And if you get it, you get it. And I was talking to uh, to Jack, and I said, "Well, <laughs> how do you think?" what do you think is going on up in the skies? And he goes, Paula, he said, that's all theater. He said, when you have that kind of experiment experience, he said, that is changing your consciousness. Yeah. So here we go into the conversation of consciousness. They, if you stay in the same spot, you learn nothing, but random, um, you know, random seeing craft or random having things happen to you awakens a certain level of consciousness and unless the planet does raise its consciousness, I always say we're toast. You might as well forget it. I use the word toast because I don't <laughs> know, you know, uh, the, yeah. the messages from Latin America on are all ecological. That, that we're going to have problems with water. We're going to have yeah. problems with, with our climate. 
that people are going to die if we don't change the way that we treat nature. So, you know, this is Latin America. So, you know, my dream is, Anna, if you really want to know, is to do a university course over all this because all of my data, everybody I've interviewed, all the, the books, everything, if people study it, they will put together the pieces of the puzzle themselves. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about the movies that feature extraterrestrial intelligent life. And I can list a handful of them from the top of my head. But then I decided to look it up. And I was stunned to see over 100 titles listed on uh, Wikipedia. Of course, each of those movies deals with the subject of extraterrestrial life in a different way. But still, the sheer number is very impressive. I will include the link uh, in the show notes to uh, that Wikipedia page for people to see. But now I could name just a few ones. Contact, Alien, E.T., Star Trek, Star Wars, Space Odyssey, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Communion, Men in Black. I understand that you have had some involvement in unpacking the messages and the agenda behind some of those movies in relation to the truth or messages, again, about ETs and UFOs. Could you please speak to this? What are those messages? What is the agenda behind some of those Hollywood movies, which are much more than entertainment? And who is behind it? Well, I teach a course for Dr. Michael Sala at Exopolitics Institute called Movies, uh, Hollywood and Disclosure. And in the early days, the government, the government, it's not the government, it's whoever's managing this, because I don't think the government knows who's doing it. It's too compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. Wanted to test the human reactions. So they went to Walt Disney and they they went to a, a Ward Kimball, who was the creator of Jiminy Cricket. And they said, how can we put this out so that we can test what the reaction is. So there has always been an effort to see what is the human reaction to disclosure. But the one that I know the best, I was talking about the 1950s and giant rock people and Van Tassel. Well, one of the people that was still alive was a man named Robert Short. If people go to my YouTube channel, he'll talk about the day the earth stood still. That was the major test movie because that was really happening in California at the time. And Robert Wise, who, who, who was the director of that movie, uh, knew very well uh, what was going on. And Michael Rennie that came out, if you remember the Klaatu, the, the big robot behind him, that was the first The Day the Earth Stood Still. And, of course, what, what happened is the, the, we shot the, the uh, Michael Rennie. He, he then recovered and he went back in a spaceship. And he gave this lecture to planet Earth, which I put as part of my class because it's beautiful. It says you people will not be allowed to come into space until you all have a peaceful spirit and this. And it was a beautiful written message. So uh, Robert Short told me, Paula, did you know that he channeled that? That wasn't part of the script. When Robert Wise said, Michael, we got to finish this movie. What are you going to say? Michael Rennie said, don't worry about it. I'll come up with something. And it came up with this beautiful, and I can send it to you, actually, because it's part of my class, this beautiful message to mankind. Now, they re-released The Day the Earth Stood Still with new Reeves, oh, about maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the being comes back, and he doesn't bother with humanity because they're going to shoot him anyway. Uh, so he starts collecting uh, all the plants, uh, the animals, and things on planet earth that make it beautiful like the the fa the fauna and the flora and everything and one of the women that's working at at the agency where they're keeping him prisoner has a little boy and at the very last scene uh, and you can tell that the 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 alien man new reeves 
has no respect for humanity, but he sees this mother and little boy interacting with a lot of love and he gets very emotional. And so the message from the one 10 years ago, and it's called The Day the Earth Stood Still, the same movie, is with certain acts of love, there's still hope to save humanity. And so you see that in the second movie with an act of love. A lot of the other films are just entertainment. Close Encounters was an effort to to, uh, talk about Blue Book, uh, what they had been doing, because Mm -hmm. Close Encounters was international. If you remember the scene where they went to India and they heard the tones, Da 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 da, and 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 yeah. they ask the Indian guru, "Where does it come from?" And everybody points up in the sky. Then the message of Close Encounters is: this is an international phenomena, and the message you're, are being given in tones, or ideas, yeah. or thoughts, or different ways. I mean, they don't come down and just talk to you. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I said, "What do you expect that they take you for coffee?" And, and they tell you, this is ridiculous. We're dealing with another life form that obviously can make it here in some form or appears from another dimension, because I also b- believe in dimensional, you know, ETs that have mm-hmm. always been here. I mean, if you go to the Maya and the you go down to the Maya and the Aztec war, uh, uh, pyramids, if you go down to these ancient sites, they've always been here. It's always been like that. It's just that the way the planet is uh, segmented with religions and politics and institutions, it's very difficult to get the real story. And again, you would have to study it. So what is holding back the disclosure? Well, there is no disclosure. What kind of disclosure? I mean, you and I are talking, this is reality. Uh, there's data points, uh, you know, Maelstrom really happened. There's all kinds of sightings gov- over the over 1952 over the Capitol. There's disclosure. You don't need the government telling you that they flew over the Capitol. In fact, Jacques says they even shot a piece from one of the UFOs and they have it. The, and he talks about it. He said they handled it. That's mm. disclosure. What the problem is, what are people waiting for? Uh, and, and it is not it is not in the best interest of the military industrial complex. Say, guess what? We knew about it all the time. And the Air Force has some stuff and the Navy has some stuff. And Colonel Corso told me the Army had a lot of stuff because they're back engineering this stuff. Mm, yeah. And why would they tell the world? Because, I mean, for what reason? There's only one reason. And that's where I really agree with Stephen Greer. I I was in his film, uh, The Alien Hoax, I think it's called, because if there is an agenda, the agenda is to make weapons of war and to call whatever is visiting the third threat, because the first threat of Werner von Braun said was was communism. The second threat is terrorism. The third threat is going to be the alien card. You need to have an enemy in order to make the complex, the military industrial complex, Or the money that's made on Earth. Adamski said the Earth is run on war and reconstruction, he was told. If you don't have any wars, you can't have economy. He said the reason why uh, Orthon came in 1950s is we were starting NASA. And you could make a tremendous amount of money on all the spinoffs of going into outer space. And they did. I mean, medically, they made all these things. They they make uh, uh, for the astronauts. They um, they had great technologies. They had they made a miniaturization of the computers. We could have made all kinds of money and got away from the war economy. But they had the choice in the 1950s, and you can guess what they chose. Yeah. And Adamski said, if we had gone that way, where we would have made all our money going into outer space, we would have met our cousins. <laughs> <laughs> he yes. says. Because yeah. the, the the impetus, that's why, you know, disclosure, for what reason? What reason? Did they just wake up? They, first of all, they, everybody that's in the government doesn't know everything. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Are those people in the deep, deep um, black projects that are back engineering where all the materials are and everything? That's who knows. And 
if they're making these things, why in the world would they, why, I mean, would they decide one day and say, let's just tell them. And if you tell them, then it becomes, it becomes an alien threat. And you don't go into the study of perhaps it's all the opposite. It, they are definite cosmic messages. Yeah. And how, and who's going to go and say that? I mean, no, none of them will say yeah. that, that. In fact, what happened was there was a case in Italy, and I'm so angry about it, which was not a UFO shot, shooting down a, uh, a helicopter. It was the Caronia case, and they put it on the History Channel as a, a, a UFO. The UFO was watching the helicopter because the helicopter was part of testing of micro weapons in the Mediterranean. The mm -hmm. UFO was watching that. So... What did they do with that? They went straight to Harry Reid, the Congress, and they asked for money because Italy had had a shoot down of a UFO, by a UFO. Mm. And that was all false because I knew everybody there. And I had been briefed by that admiral. And, 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 and I think the admiral told me, he said, we don't know what it is. And this is the truth. I don't think they really know exactly what they're dealing with. And if you notice, even the New York Times stuff, we're still in the craft. And I already told you in the 1950s, the space people are coming off. And down in South America, they are too. So why are we still looking at Tic Tacs? <laughs> Yes. I'm way beyond. A, a brand new movie, may I suggest for you people, mm -hmm. it's come out. It's uh, James Fox's The Virginia Case. It's called Moment of Contact. I had talked in 1997 with Victoria Pacchini that was part of that investigative from Brazil. And that thing was a crash that happened in Brazil with these little beings that were stuck in the town. And that movie is amazing. And it's documented. So what do you want to do with that? Why? I mean, you can look at that or you could look at the Tic Tac that's flying around. So and, and at the end of the movie, James Fox said the Americans came and took the bodies and took the craft away. So yeah. this and that happened in 1996. So if you look at the timeline, 1996, somebody there knows what's going on in Brazil. Mm. So what are we doing in 2023 talking about little things flying over so that, you know, on in the Pacific? Yeah, I look at this because I know the body of knowledge that I know. And I'm very wary because Dr. Greer, I, I agree with 100 the, percent. There's a hidden agenda with disclosure. I mean, look, anything that came out of disclosure there because I've done all the work and, and seen disclosure as I'm doing the work, I, I would not trust. Uh, without an agenda, it would have an agenda, which is getting money for weapons or something. Yeah. So, and and the key technology issue here, obviously, is access to free energy, which will well completely uh, change the world. Well, and yes. yeah, you can't do that until you you <laughs> yeah. you can't do that until you spent every petrodollar mm. on oil. I mean, you that's can't, right. Uh, it would destabilize the whole entire planet. So then it gets into real geopolitics. But you know. Let's hope on us someday people sit down at a table and discuss it from, you know, a very intellectual point of view, because it becomes a very interesting subject. It doesn't become science fiction anymore. Absolutely. But I need to ask this question. Most people would ask regarding the disclosure. OK, so the government has an agenda. We get that. But why the ETs? Are holding back? Why don't they take control and charge and take over the disclosure? I.e., here we here we are. We can be seen. We can be communicated with. What is holding them back? Is there some sort of agreement or agreements between them and governments not to? No, no, that's ridiculous. No? They don't need that. They, and besides, they would never. They don't need that. Okay, so what's I holding don't them back? Any kind of agreement? No. Um, if you have a child, you're not going to push the child to walk before it crawls. Mm -hmm. This is about the evolution of a species, okay. us. And if we had somebody like, the, uh, please watch the day the earth stood still, because if we had somebody like that, we would make a religion around him. 
Mm -hmm. All the cults and religions, you know, Val Thor, all the people, the the alien that came, you know, and that doesn't help the average human. The average human needs to grow up and to be personally responsible. And they're and they're not going to make it easy, but they're they haven't they haven't abandoned us, obviously. What they do is fly over places like Ukraine right now and go, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Yeah. And and they do it in a way, like Jock says, it's kind of theater. It wakens your reality. Why would they come? I mean, how could you unify uh, a world with a more important power? Think of history. Think of the Spanish that came and, and uh, took over South America and put down the, the natives there. Think of that. Yeah. Think of the more powerful civilization that took over the. And then I talked to Clifford Stone and I said, Clifford, um, you know, you did crash retrieval. And he goes, yeah, Paula, there's 57 different races, including the one in Virginia, which I didn't even know how to call that. And, you know, uh, what, they all have different agendas. They all have different reasons for making themselves appear. They have all different reasons for contacting. It may help you if I say that disclosure will come from the people, like like uh, Stephen Greer says, from the bottom up, not from the top down. Mm -hmm. The top down changes. Colonel Corso used to say, Paula, what do you mean government? It changes every four years. Which government are you talking about? And I, and I said, well, we shouldn't even use that word. And he said, you're right. We shouldn't use that word. So it, it is compartmentalized up there in our governmental structure. I mean, no, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. The Army doesn't know what the Navy and the... I mean, when Colonel Corso was telling me, he said, we had the artifacts, but we were doing it for the Army because we wanted the contracts. Mm -hmm. So what, what does the Air Force have? Did the Air Force have the stuff in San Antonio? Yeah. You know, I mean... What 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 are the other parts? So I think if you can look at it this way, Anna, and and we go and we only have a little time. The the only way to solve this on a spiritual and an intellectual level is the raising of consciousness, and the only way you can raise consciousness is to let the baby grow up and learn and hurt itself, and then it starts walking and it realizes it destroyed half the planet. The only time we ever come together is when there's a tsunami or there's a crisis yeah. or we have to help each other. But, mm -hmm. you know, I get very angry. I say, well, why do we have to have the tsunami and all these people die and then everybody loves each other? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh not what humanity should be. They yeah. should want to help each other anyway and not wait until the ecological disaster, yeah. the war, whatever we create to come together. Uh, you know, before I give any lectures anywhere anymore, I make them play John Lennon's Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I'll talk, but you got to play Imagine. <laughs> He's like, yes, Imagine. absolutely. <laughs> yes. And the other song that I quite often love listening to is Louis Armstrong singing the beautiful oh, yes. world. Yeah. Wonderful. It's the one the wonderful the world. world yeah. It it's just yeah, if you if you listen to just those two songs, they put you in the in the right state of mind and understanding and appreciation. So absolutely yeah, beaut and beautiful. And that's called consciousness. Yeah. So uh, well, people say well you define that. It means being awake and aware of where your surrounding is. Where your where your surroundings are and who you really are, you're part of a divine plan, mm. and you're part of a divine plan that somebody yeah. did as something, and then you keep forgetting that because then you go back to money, war, and all this other stuff, and so whatever is out there, and I can't put a name on it, and they certainly wouldn't work with the government. <laughs> it's like, they don't need to. They can do what they want, when they want, how they want. Yes, They're, and that's the pro part that scares. The military, because you can't control this phenomenon. You can't. Mm, and how can you control the missile shutdown? You tell them to go away. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, the, those poor uh, men uh, in, in Maelstrom, you know, they were begging to come into the bunkers. They were so scared. <laughs> you can't control that, you yeah. know. And that is a terrible thing to say to, to the people. Guess what? We're your military. We can't control this. Um so yes. you need to look at what 
and how it happens. So it happens to get your attention, the sighting, whatever happens, Mm -hmm. to get your attention. Once they got your attention, then it's up to you to digest it and become more aware and awake. And that's consciousness, to raise the consciousness. Yeah, and it makes... And it makes absolutely perfect sense. So, Paula, could you now tell us more about Starworks USA, your not-for-profit organization? Because I understand you you are doing quite a lot of work with it. You have some meetings, gatherings. Could you please tell us about it? And again, I will include the link to the website in the show notes. Yes, actually, to my media company, I'm doing the last conference in Laughlin, and I'm doing it on messages from the Andes. Um, I'm doing it on uh, uh, different speakers from people talking about Gobekli Tempe to uh, Sean McNamara, who's going to talk about the development of psychokinesis and, mm-hmm. and ESP. And then Ricardo Gonzalez, who has had interaction with this, the spaceman because he was part of that group in the 1970s. So that happens in November 11th to 13th near near Las Vegas. Then I'm I'm done. I'm done with regular ufology. My materials okay. are going to uh to Rice University including the piece from the Trinity site eventually. I just want to go down to Latin America and and I will report back to everybody the information I find from the messages that are being given to the people, the regular people in the fields, the regular people in the towns and and so forth. And that's called, and that'll be a series of of lectures and that's called uh, Starworks USA Media. And that's gonna be on Vimeo. I have some lectures up there already. Um, And I I will do my best, uh, you know, when, Somebody like Edgar Mitchell tells me the thoughts control everything and that they travel faster than the speed of light almost instantly from the moon to the earth. Then I realize that what we need to do is to, uh, to you know, meditate, get together in groups of people pray, they pray or whatever it is, but control the thought process of this planet with positivity. Not fear, because fear is the thing that shuts everything down and then you go nowhere. So my work from now on will be to raise consciousness in some way. And I suggest that, you know, you read some of the past books that talk about that. One of them in particular, All of the Above and Beyond. Um, and, you know, that's where I want to, I want something to happen on. Otherwise, why do I bother doing this? You know, <laughs> uh, something, I mean, something needs to change. We need to move the meat and the needle a little bit. Yeah. Otherwise what we're in the same position we were during world war two and the cold war and everything. Yeah. I mean, that's so discouraging. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to think like that. I want to think that we can model a behavior, model it not talk about love and all this, but model of behavior, which will cause planetary change. Absolutely. I have titled this episode, Extraterrestrial Presence, A New Paradigm for Humanity. Obviously, we talked about it um, pretty much throughout this conversation. But to wrap it up, could you please talk briefly to what is this new paradigm? What is this new narrative? What does it mean for us to know well, that this is happening? I think that humanity can grow up. I think humanity can be beautiful. And just like your Louis Armstrong song, I think humanity can come together. I think humanity can develop its own potential. I mean, we all have these potentials and we can send a message to the cosmos. Uh, we're ready to meet you. We're ready to become part of a a society that is enlightened. But right now, if they look at what's happening on the planet, they'll go, these people aren't very enlightened. (laughs) So, uh, you know, what does it mean for us? Whatever is visiting, whatever is sending messages in Latin America or everywhere, whatever is watching the wars, whatever is still hopeful. They have hope that we will get our act together. And that's my wish too. Well, what a beautiful way to end this conversation, Paula. Thank you so very much for your time, for your presence, and for sharing with us 
all those beautiful messages. Thank you. No, Anna. thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All the best. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.